This is Pokemon Blue in all of its glory running on an original Nintendo Game Boy. And this is what we have today. Huh. Since the 90s, many things have changed in the gaming world. For example, the play where you want movement that became popular with the Game Boy skyrocketed with other devices like the Game Boy Color and later on the Nintendo DS and the PSP. And then it died. Around the PS4 era, pretty much every attempt to do something like that didn't work, even with astounding hardware like the PS Vita had. And then it became popular again with the Nintendo Switch, which inspired companies to develop Linux mobile video games like the Steam Deck. And then, because of the technology evolution, especially with the development of emulation, we got this. Cheap mobile emulators. This is the Miu Mini Plus and most people who buy it end up modifying the operating system to a version made by the community which is way better than the stock version. Like now it allows you to quickly change between games, have a better menu design and an overall faster navigation. However, the stock Miu Mini Plus OS and the stock SD card that comes with it is filled with a lot of games. And between them, is this Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue, the first games in the franchise to ever be announced. But this is emulation, so what is the main difference between playing those and playing in the original hardware, like in the actual Game Boy? Like why should you buy this instead of just getting yourself a Game Boy? You see, the Nintendo Game Boy was a first generation device, and I, as an actual average VR enjoyer, know what that means. First generation gadgets have to prove a point, and the Game Boy had to do that. But it had many, many things it could be better at. The most glaring one by, by far is the screen. Back in the day, the dot matrix was the most viable option. You know, it was cheap and got the job done. Batteries were a thing to power these devices. And if you had a spectacular screen with beautiful colors and, and backlight, you would run out of batteries too often and would eventually consider this hobby to be too expensive. So the original Game Boy didn't have a backlit screen, which people claim was a pain in the butt back in the day, but not necessarily because of the lack of resolution or sharpness on the games even though those were pretty bad. But just because of how hard it was to actually see what you're playing pretty much everywhere. The screen had literal no light, meaning that if you wish to play something in your bedroom at night, you would need a lamp or, or something like that. There were even attachments you could get to try to make it better, but eh. However, I, I don't think that would be the case today. We're so used to have a top-notch screen technology that going back would require like you gotta really want to play on a Game Boy to deal with the screen it has. So if you were to get a Game Boy properly saying, you would have to deal with the fact that you wouldn't get a new one unless you have a, a lot of money to spare. And even if you find one in a good state, there's basically no way you can no-brain everything. Like you wouldn't necessarily have to learn how to mod buttons, how to check if everything's alright with the hardware all the time, and of course, buy GB cartridges, which are usually not cheap nowadays. In the other hand, you could get a modern device with a modern screen that already comes with way more games than you'll ever want to play. And along with those games, there's Pokemon Red and Blue, the first generation of Pokemon. So how does this emulation thing handle those games? It's not hard to guess that since Game Boy presented one of the first mobile gaming technologies to the world, it wouldn't be hard to replicate those games nowadays through emulation. And if you think this way, you're completely right. Everything runs like a charm. And of course, you have the ease of owning a new device with a phone-like screen. You can play wherever you want, however you want, and I own an original Nintendo Game Boy Advance, which I don't know where it is right now, but I also have a fake one. And only by playing with that, I learned how valuable it is to have a screen that actually glows. So answering the darn question, yes, the Mio Mini Plus runs pretty much every Game Boy game extraordinarily, since they're so easy to emulate. Consequently, you're able to have an extremely high fast forward speed, which is a feature that you can use in emulators to make the game run faster. So here's a 5 seconds clip of the Mew Mini Plus's performance with and without fast forward. The first Pokemon's generation history begins way back in 1981. Like there was this guy named Satoshi Tajiri, the same first name as Ash's name in Japanese Pokemon. He was the one who wrote, edited and sold his own arcade video games magazine called 
Game Freak. And lots of people liked it and decided to contribute with the magazine the way they could, including the artist Ken Sugimori, who eventually became the magazine's official illustrator. As time went on, they noticed something with arcade games. Most of them sucked. So Satoshi and Ken looked at each other and were like, dude, it feels like every video game is the same and all of them are mediocre, so why don't we make our own games? So eight years later, in 1989, Game Freak finally became an actual game development company. And they made some pretty solid games. Their first one was Mando Palace, but right after that, they made Smart Ball and even Yoshi's game. All of that in their first three years as a game development company. However, it would take four more years to release in 1996 the two games that were actually one that would forever be their cash cow. Of course, I'm talking about Pokemon Red and Green. You see, since Satoshi loved to collect bugs as a kid, it made all the sense in the world to make a game where he could make other people feel how it is to go walk on your own and collect different creatures. Some that you already know and some that you have never seen before. The main plot of the game tells the story of this 10 year old who becomes a Pokemon trainer, challenges all the gyms and stops Team Rocket from Team Rocketing around. But in the end, most people found themselves more entertained trying to collect every 150 Pokemon. Lots of people claim that this feeling of completionism is what drives them to actually keep playing. This is where the two versions come in, with version exclusive Pokemon. So if you bought the red version, the only way you can get access to the green version's exclusive Pokemon was to have a friend who has it or to buy that game too. So if you had a friend who has it, you would make use of the Game Boy's link cable with them. So this simplicity made Pokemon huge as it is getting several special releases. The first one was an all special blue version that would only be sent through mail orders for subscribers of a Japanese manga magazine called Koro Koro Comic. Although it got a bit less special since it started being sold in game stores two years later in 1998. However, this was the exact same year when the second special version came out, Pokemon Yellow. This game adapted lots of points in the main plot to make it feel like way more of what kids saw in the anime. You see, none of the previous games made by Game Freak actually made their way out of Japan, but the sudden humongous success of Pokemon was actually begging them to start trying to spread that all around the world. So those games were re-released in 1998 in their respective North American adaptations as Pokemon Red and Blue for some reason ignoring the green version. Pokemon gaming went from its original release in the first mainstream mobile gaming machine humanity has ever seen to an affordable mobile gaming machine, which honestly, most consumers just buy to play Pokemon anyways. Now let's be frank here, most people just end up buying the Mew Mini Plus and other emulators just to have a dedicated Pokemon machine, like a Tamagotchi. And this is where we can start to notice some things. In North America, way more people have an iPhone compared to people who own Android devices. And Android is historically known to be extremely friendly to pretty much every kind of emulation, from the Game Boy all the way to Nintendo Switch nowadays. However, iPhone users were always restricted to use the phones they had paid for due to supposed security reason imposed by Apple. There used to be one or two workarounds for that. Playing stuff through emulators that were being ran in Safari or other browsers, like, sure. But some weeks ago, due to the rise of some legal restrictions over Apple, emulators are now available in the App Store, which means that you can play with what is, in my experience, the best mobile emulator out there, what is called Delta Emulator for the iPhone. This brings for some people a complex they didn't have to think about before. Like now you don't need to buy a dedicated device to run your Pokemon game, just play it for free on your phone. Like it has no ads, no annoying banners on screen, nothing. It's perfect for what it's supposed to do. Sure, touch screen controls will never be as good as physical buttons, I hate touch screens as much as you do and probably more but pokemon doesn't require precise controlling nor quick reflexes so it's 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 doable here so for some people it is absolutely not necessary to spend tens of dollars on a device that you don't need like it's one more thing you're gonna have to carry with you charge and take care of one day or not 
However, some people feel absolutely annoyed by how oversaturating information on their phones is. Or like that moment you grab your phone to play something, but like you're holding the mini computer you use to do everything with. So some people just start texting friends, watching videos, or just doing anything besides gaming. You know, people are different, and some have a tougher time than others to spend time on their hobbies. Personally, this is where I find myself in. So it just becomes a handy and nice thing to have a dedicated machine for you to store your games and to be a refuge of the whole everything is connected to everyone thing the world has today. Sure, this topic deserves a whole video for it, but in today's rushed world, for some people, it might all come down to, to spend money or to not spend money. That is the question. Oh, and I almost forgot to talk about the thumbnail. Well, that's Mew, that's one of its first designs. And the beta and the first designs overall of Pokemon were definitely different from what they are today. So check out these old designs. Really different, right? Thank you guys for watching this video. If you like it, make sure to subscribe so YouTube will keep sending you the videos I make. And please consider just commenting something, like pretty much anything. That's gonna help me big time in spreading my channel around. Goodbye.